Destiny Preparation Church. Can y'all help me? Put your hands together. Come on. This is Pastor David Stewart of Destiny Preparation Church welcoming you to our program, Road to Destiny, brought to you by Destiny Preparation Church. And I'm welcoming you as well into a new year. It is 2014. We made it into another year. I'm not sure if all of us thought we might make it. It's just been so many things going on. You know, perhaps you've been so stressed out going through so many different things. But you know what? Thank God we made it. You know, there's, there's been a tough time. It was a tough year in 2013 in this community, in Rochester, in general. So many things going on. So much violence. So much turn of mindset. So many challenges. There's a lot of things going on. But thank God we did make it to a new, new year. And I'm praying, and I hope you'll pray as well, that God will do some great things for us in this community in 2014. I hope you had a good New Year's Eve. We had a great time here joining together, celebrating in the new year in the right way, in, in, the, in the presence of God. What a great way to start the year because it, it helps establish the priorities for the year. If you didn't have a chance to go to service or if you weren't at our church and perhaps you had another one, you know, I pray that your, your New Year's Eve went well and was safe and you are now ready spiritually, mentally, emotionally to have a great year in 2014. I'm looking forward to some great things and I hope that you are too. I hope you have some expectations and I hope you'll take time with us to prepare for this new year. Typically in January we spend some time in, in prayer and in, and in services really meditating and trying to understand what it is that God has for us. What do we need to do differently? What things we need to leave behind? What things we need to take ahead of us? The Bible tells us that the Apostle said forgetting those things which are behind reaching to those things which are ahead. I press towards the mark. What things we need to let go of? What things are we pursuing in 2014? You may not have made you know, your list of New Year's resolutions, but you may want to make a list of things that you want to pursue and that you want to change in your life. There's things that we need to really put in front of us and say, you know what? I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to let go of this. I'm going to go after this. And it's a great time to put those things in balance with what God wants to do in your life. It's a great time to stop and listen and hear from God. And so I invite you to come and join us during this month as we take the time to stop and listen and hear from God. And I pray that it will bless you being a part of here, of a church as well. If you're not connected to somewhere and you're trying to go through all these things by yourself, let me just tell you, there's such an advantage, such a benefit of being connected and with a body of believers who can pray with you, encourage you. I've watched so many times over the years, people picked off one by one as they separate themselves all on their own because problems come in and they go off and try and handle it and deal with it. And the devil, he desires, he told Paul, he, Peter, he desired to sift him as wheat, to separate him so he could break him down. Don't be separated. You need connection more than you realize. You need it for you and you need it to be able to pour out into somebody else. So if you're not connected to a church, I invite you and I implore you, I encourage you, start this year by connecting up with the body of Christ in some local church. We'd love to have you join us here, and I believe that you'll find us a place that will help nourish you and you'll be able to pour into as well. We meet here for services typically on Sundays and Wednesdays. Sundays, it takes place starting at 10 o'clock with our morning uh, Sunday school classes that take place, followed by our morning worship here at 11.30 a.m., you're cordially invited to join us for any of these services. We also meet on Wednesdays for a midweek Bible study. We all come and gather together at Wednesday, starting with prayer at 6.30 and then fall at 7 p.m. And I want to let you know about a very special service coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a, a men's conference that's being prepared right now for you. I want to invite all the men, young and old, to come and join us as we have some great services Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, January 16th through 18th, just a couple weeks away. We're 
preparing everything now. We're going to have a great time, a great time of music and worship from the men on Friday, a guest speaker and, and a powerful service on Thursday, and then services and, and, and teaching training during the day on Saturday morning. It's going to be a wonderful time. Ladies, you want to see your men step out, get them out to this conference. It's going to be a great time. Several churches are coming to join with us. Looking forward to having a great, great group of men come together and, and inspire each other. We talked about that connection. This is going to, we're going to inspire each other by coming together. When, when your man sees another man worshiping, when your man sees another friend of his that it's connected up to God, it's going to be powerful. So I invite you to come and join us, connect up, come together. It's going to be a wonderful time. All right. Now, let me take you to the word of God. Here's something to uh, inspire you as we start into this first year. We are talking about faith. We are trying to build in this concept of faith. We spent a good deal of time here in the church over the past couple of months, really not only studying this and preaching about but but practicing it, figuring out how we apply it to our lives. And so this sermon continues along that aspect of faith. It's a challenge for you to understand and grasp and, and live and apply in your life. The question is, is God really God? Because if he truly is the God that we've heard about and great and powerful as he is, we need to be able to trust him that he can handle us with every situation we're going through. He's able, more than able, and willing to help us if we'll trust him. I pray that this will inspire and touch you, and I pray that I'll see you in our services real soon. Don't forget about the men's conference. We'll talk more about that in the next couple weeks, but don't wait till then. Come and join us any week. You need to be connected up. We're looking forward to meeting you. God bless you. I hope to see you real soon. Hebrews 1 and 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. What does that mean? Does it just mean making God happy? Does that mean just, you know, being in a, in a right place with him? I, I dare ch challenge you to suggest that it means even more than that, it's deeper than that. Without faith, it's not even possible to operate in, in, in alignment with God would have, would have for our lives. Without faith, the relationship doesn't work. That's important for us to understand. In other words, if you can't trust God, the relationship that's supposed to exist between you and him will never work right. There will always be problems. There will always be stumbling blocks. There will always be things that don't work out the way they're supposed to work out. You have to be able to trust him. Without it, it's impossible to please him. It says two things. It says, number one, you have to believe that he is... And that's a challenge. That's a stumbling block I want to talk about today. You have to really believe that he is. Not only that he exists, but you have to believe that he is God. That's a bigger deal. That's a bigger issue for us. It's one thing to believe that somebody exists. It's one thing to believe that there's a God and, and you know, he, he's there. There's an existence. That's the first level. But you have to believe that he's God, which means that you have to believe that he's bigger than you. Hmm. That's where the problems start rising up. You have to believe that he's bigger than you. How many of you ever have a, an older brother, an older sister, older sibling? Anybody? Couple? Amen? And how many have had times when you had to face the fact as you were growing up that they were bigger than you? <laughs> Some of us have been in denial along that route at times. Amen? I've been there, done that myself. Amen? I beat down a couple times. Praise God. Amen? <laughs> Sooner or later, you have to deal with the fact that they're bigger than you, which means that they can do things that you can't necessarily do. Sorry. <laughs> Someone have a little problem right now. Sorry. That's the truth. Amen? They could reach up to a cabinet that you couldn't reach. Perhaps they could, they could, they could work on the stove before you were allowed to touch anything. Right, Ron? <laughs> Yeah, right around in the stoves. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I owe you a couple. <laughs> you know, there are things that they could do that we couldn't necessarily do because they are bigger than us. They have more power, more strength, sometimes more experience than us. And it's hard for us to accept the fact that there is somebody, there are some things that are bigger than us. If in order to please God, you're going to have to believe that he's God. Which means that he can handle things that you can't. He can see things that you can't see, understand things you can't understand, comprehend things that you can't understand, can't comprehend. And that's a challenge for us because a lot of times we like to end it as far as we can see it. And if we can't figure it out, then who else can? Because of course we know we're the smartest individual in the room. Amen? <laughs> Maybe not. 
We have to be able to trust him enough to believe that he's God. And because he's God, situations that I can't handle and can't control, he can. Why is that important? Because that enables you to put yourself in a position to depend on him. Because he's God. You have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. He seek him. In other words, you have to believe that he works in your benefit. He's on your side. Not only is he God, but he's on your side. If you believe those two things, if I believe that, 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 that somebody, that Brother Josh is on my side, it's your day, Josh. If I believe that he is able to do something and he's working on my, my behalf, then if I need something done, I'm going to assume that he's willing to do it for me. If he can do it and he's out for my interests, then I can trust and I can depend on him that he will do this for me. If I'm not sure if he's really that, if I'm that, I'm that much of a priority for him, I might not be as willing to, to depend on him. Because I'm not sure if he's really going to work in my interests. If you believe in God and you believe that he's working on your behalf, then you can depend, you can lean into, you can trust him for certain things. But if you never trust him, it's impossible to please him. That's why faith is so important. But, but the question I really want to deal with today in terms of God is the first piece of that, believing in him. Do we really believe in him? Do we really believe that God is really God? And when do we come to that conclusion and how do we come to it? Because if you believe it, your behaviors are going to be one way. If you're not really believing it, then your behaviors are going to go a whole other direction. The question is, do I believe in God? So why should I believe? Why, why, what is it that makes me believe that God is God? Well, first of all, understand this, that the whole concept of faith or trust is ultimately a choice. It's a choice that you have to make. You have to decide to trust someone. It's a decision. You don't just happen to start doing it until you first made a choice. You decide whether you're going to trust this person to do this. You decide whether you're going to lean in on something, whether you're going to, to allow this to support, to help you. Even inanimate things, this podium, before I'm leaning on it, amen, I'm going to consciously have to assume, I'm making a decision that I trust this enough to lean on it. Otherwise, I'm never putting weight on it. I'll just stand here like this and just touch it a little bit. Amen. Faith is a choice that has to be made. So why do we trust? Why do we make that choice to trust people? Typically because, number one, they demonstrate capability. In other words, they, they demonstrate that they have what it takes to execute the job. I'm going to trust you to do this. I'm going to trust you to cook my dinner uh, because you've demonstrated it. I'm not just, oh, you want to cook? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, go for it. I might want to taste your food first. I, want, I might want to know somebody else has tasted your food, right? Before I trust you to do it. So I need you to demonstrate to me that you're able to do it. You're going to fix my car for me? Thank you. But you're going to let just anybody fix your car? Huh? Somebody might want to know that, you know, they actually know what they're doing, right? Have you done this before? Oh, I've fixed all kind of cars, but not this kind of car, right? Oh, I've done all kind of things. I've changed windshield wipers. I've, you know, fill, refilled the, you know, the water in the, in the radiator tank. But you're talking about fixing my brakes. Uh, have, have you done? Well, you know, okay, yeah, just show me what, what wrench do I use. Wait a minute, hold up. You don't even know? <laughs> You've got to prove that you're dependable to me before I'm going to trust you in this. And then you have to demonstrate trustworthiness. How many of you know people, you know, you maybe hired or had somebody, and you know they were capable, but you weren't really sure if they were going to do it? Mm -hmm. You said, had somebody, yeah, they're going to paint my house. Okay, I've, I've seen their work. I know they can paint, but I don't know when they're going to come. You're going to cut my grass, but I don't really, you know, they're not really reliable. They might show up, or they might not. Half the house might get painted, and the other half is kind of still waiting. Uh-huh. You ever know some? I've had people, you know, when I've, I've lined them up to pave my driveway. They're going to pave the driveway. Sure. Give them a date. They're all set. Date comes by, nobody shows up. They've got all the right equipment. I've seen them working down the road, but they didn't show up at my house. 
So you have, to, you have to prove that you're capable and that you're dependable if you're really going to get the, if you're going to get my trust. You've got to prove your integrity. You've got to prove you're reliable. You have to demonstrate that you're dependable. All these things are things that help us make the choice to trust somebody. Now God dem has demonstrated his trustworthiness based on, number one, the fact of what he's done for others. We look at the Bible, we look at the stories, we look at how he saved da da Daniel from the lion's den. We look at how he saved uh, so many more, David from the lion and from the bear. We look at how he kept people in impossible situations. We look at how he protected the children of Israel. We look at all the different stories of what he's done. And, de and God demonstrates his reliability. He demonstrated when he pulled the children out of e Egypt, children of Israel, out of Egypt, and parted the Red Sea for them. He demonstrated all the different aspects of what he was capable of doing over and over again. And it helps to establish a reliability, a trustworthiness in him because of what he's done in the past. We look at all the different people, not only those, but things that people have gone through different personal issues and problems and troubles and trials and God saved them and kept them. We look at Jesus and how he showed mercy and how he healed and how he delivered. We see the heart of God in that and we say, hmm, this is somebody perhaps who is capable of doing these things. Not only do we look at what he's done in the past, but then we look at what he's done for us. The greatest testimony that we have, and by the way, the testimony is all around us too. You look at not only what he's done in the Bible, you look at what he's done for the people in this room. You look at what he's done for your family members and how their lives have changed. You look at what he's done for people in the church when they come up and give their testimony of how God has blessed them and kept them. And you say, well, if God could do it for them, then he's certainly capable of handling my situations. Amen. Then we look at what he's done for us. Because the best testimony you could ever have is the testimony that you've experienced yourself. And it's the things that he's done for you in the past, though they may be simple, though they may have been in the past, that encourage you, well, if I'm going through something today, I remember what God did for me yesterday. And if he was able to do something for me then, he must be able to do something for this situation right now. So we trust in him, we build up dependability, reliability because of what he's done through his word, through his experience. But ultimately it comes down to this, you have to make a decision, you have to make a choice to believe in God, to trust in him. Listen, it's, it's not just a theological principle thing. It's not just a matter of, of, of defining from the scriptures because this scripture says it and, and because of this and, and that. People ask you, you know, how did the world come to be? And you go to the Bible and you say, well, it says that's and that's. Well, how can that be? And how can you prove it? Give me evidence. And people give all kind of evidence. Well, if you look at the way nature is made, you look at the probability factors, you look at the things that happen in sequence, it doesn't just line up to what the Bible says. You look at all these things, but the bottom line does not come down to a theological proof. Sooner or later, you've got to make a choice. You have to make a decision as to whether you're going to believe God or not. And you can base it on the undeniable facts, you can base it on the weight of evidence, you can base it on the history, you can base it on what you've been taught, but sooner or later it comes down to this. Each and every one of us must make a choice as to whether we believe God or don't. I like this little saying I heard a couple of weeks ago. It says, for those who believe, no proof is necessary. For those who don't believe, no proof is sufficient. It's an interesting statement. Stuart Chase said that. For those who believe, no proof is necessary. I believe. I trust. I don't need anything else. For those who don't believe, no proof is sufficient. No matter how much evidence you come up with, they're never going to believe. You better experience somebody like that, no matter what you show them, they're just not going to believe. It's, they're just not going to believe. I'm not just talking about God. I'm talking about in life. You try and convince them that this is right, this is going to happen, this is the thing. Whatever you show them, they're just not going to believe it. Because ultimately, it comes down to the choice. You've got to choose. The Bible says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. You need to make a decision. And be careful because if you don't make a decision, no decision is not an answer either because no decision leaves life in a pretty frustrated state. 
If you don't make a decision, you end up in a void. If you end up in a gray zone, you end up in the midst of everything. Then you can't really base and make decisions and live principles. You can't live godly principles because you don't trust him to do it. It doesn't work. It just frustrates. It's impossible to please him. Every time you, you try and put God in a piece of your life, but then take the other pieces back, it frustrates it. So you don't get the joy of being in Christ. You don't get the joy of going out at least enjoying yourself in your flesh. So you're just mixed up because you do that, you feel guilty. You go to God, you won't trust him. You just end up in between the two and life is never satisfying. It's always a frustration. You have to make a choice. Now understand this, even when you've made a choice, even if you decide I'm gonna believe in God, let me give you this, this heads up, this warning. Even in Christ, things don't always come easy. Even when you're in Christ, everything is not always simple and automatic and things don't always work the way you want them to work. Hear this, you're not going to like this, but hear this. God never promised you an easy life. He never said life was going to always be easy for you. He never made you that promise. It's not in the Bible. That's not what you signed up for in serving Christ. If anything, Jesus warned us the opposite of that. He told us, you have to bear your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Said, they're not going to like you. <laughs> that doesn't sound like an easy life. God never made you that promise. Whoever put that in your mind, take it away. That's not what he promised. We look for things that, that, that build up on the outside. And so we're so focused sometimes on the outside as being our, our indicator uh, of what it is to walk with God. If I walk with God, then all these other things shall be great and, and wonderful. He did say, seek him first and all these things shall be added to you because he did promise to take care of you, but he never promised that it was always going to be easy and simple. And the reality of it is it's not because there are always things that are going to tempt you to do things other than God's way. It's always going to be things pulling you to make a choice in the other direction, even if it's just for a moment. That's not easy. Sometimes that's very problematic because some of the things you see outside of God can look a lot better and simpler than the things that you see in God. That's not easy. It's not easy to see I'm trying to live right, trying to do right, trying to do all the things I'm supposed to do. And here's my buddy over here. He don't know nothing about God, don't care nothing about God. And here he is rising up like a rocket. And here I am still at the same point. That's not easy. Right. It's not easy to see people who with quick fixes and jump in and jump out and doing all the things they want and enjoying the lust of the flesh and, and, and loving it. And here you are trying to do right. And it seems like you're not getting anywhere. That's not easy. God never promised you the easy life. He did promise to take care of you. In Matthew 11 and 13, he says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's he talking about? He just said, life itself isn't necessarily easy. But remember that thing about trust. Because we're supposed to be trusting God. And if we trust God truly trust him, enough to depend on him, enough to lean on him, then he says, my yoke is easy. What he says in the scripture is, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. What's, what's the yoke? What's the yoke he's talking about? The yoke he's talking about is the amount of pressure that you should be handling. That's the yoke. In this situation, in this relationship, a yoke, by the way, is a wooden piece that used to connect up between two animals. They used to have oxen that would go out in, in the fields and, and they would lead them by these, this yoke. The yoke would be across them, keep them together, keep them so that they, and they would from that carry the weight of the trial, of the plow as they pulled it through the field. The yoke was the weight that, that, that was secured to them. And he says, your yoke's supposed to be easy. Why does our yoke feel so hard? Because some of us don't feel like we, we're wearing light yokes. <laughs> Some of us don't look like we were wearing light, you know, light yokes. Why is the yoke so hard? The reason comes when not trusting in him. Because if we trust in him, he says, the yoke then, he says, take my yoke. Because the yoke that you're carrying is way too heavy for you. If you take my yoke, in other words, if you lock up with me, I'll carry the bulk of the weight. 
and all you have to do is trust me to take you through. My yoke to you is intended to be easy. And you know what? When you truly learn how to trust God, life becomes a whole lot easier. Not only in terms of the things and the situation you go through, and it doesn't mean that things are going to go away and that you'll never have any problems come your way. But you know what? Taking the stress level off of trying to figure it all out and resolve it and come up with the answers and hustle and flow and kick and do all the things you're trying to do to make it work out, that all goes away when you trust God. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm going to work this out. I don't know how to change this situation. I don't know how to deal with this. Give it to God and your yoke becomes easy. Your burden becomes light. Matthew 6 and 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Most of our time today is spent trying to figure out what we're going to eat and what we're going to drink and what we're going to put on. Amen? And he's saying, don't even worry about that. Why are you so worried about that? That's where he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you. The reason that our yoke is so heavy is because we're tr we don't trust God enough to depend on him to handle it for us. And every time it starts looking difficult or bad, we take that yoke right back and we try and handle it ourselves. You gotta believe that he is, that he's God. And that no matter how great the problem in front of you might seem, the God you serve is greater than any problem that comes your way. This program is being provided by Destiny Preparation Church. We'd like to invite you to join us in any of our services. If you're looking to better understand God's purpose for your life, if you'd like to experience the true presence of God, or you're in need of a church home, join us at Destiny Preparation Church. For more information about our services, ministry, or church family, See our website at destinypreparation.org or call 720-5426. Join us on the road to your destiny.